Hello, everyone. Thank you for tuning in to today's webcast. My name is Zina M. Pagan. I am ARF's Marketing Manager and your moderator for today. Before we begin learning more about neuromarketing advertising effectiveness, I'll go over a few items. We are aiming to provide the best webcast experience possible. You can help us execute this by muting yourself and keeping your web camera turned off. Unfortunately, if you do turn on your cameras or unmute yourself, I will have to disconnect your access to today's webcast. The audio will be streamed. This means that you will be able to hear us throughout your computer speakers. However, if you prefer to use a teleconference option, please use the information provided on your screen. Additionally, I will post the information in the chat box um, in case you lose it. Should you have any questions during the session, please send those to me also using the chat box. ARF does not own the rights to the presentation. However, the, the session will be recorded. If you would like to view the recorded event, the file will be available within two weeks from today. We are extending the conversation on social media. If you'd like to join us, please use hashtag ARF webcast. If you're interested in hosting a webcast of your own, please contact me at zena at thearf.org. Now for the fall, we are hosting several events. If you're able to, please join us. Our next webcast will feature another Journal of Advertising Research 2015 Best Paper winner, measuring long-term effectiveness of TV advertising with CVS's David Poltrak and Nielsen Catalina Solutions' Leslie Wood. And for those of you joining us on the West Coast, we are happy to announce that the ARF will be back at Facebook headquarters for an ARF West event next month. Our conference will feature multiple award-winning agency Crispin Porter and Bogoski, his, um, their Chief Strategy Officer, Eric Sunsik, will keynote, and we will cover topics on mastering mobile marketing. If you're interested in any one of these events or other ARF programs, please check our website for further details, or you can email me or contact me directly. And now I present Nanette Burns, the ARF's Managing Editor for the Journal of Advertising Research. Yes, hello. Uh and welcome today. Uh, every January, members of the JAR, or Journal of Advertising Research, editorial board vote for best practitioner paper and best academic paper. The winners are announced at the ARF's annual conference in March. Dwayne Varon, the lead author of this year's best academic paper for 2015, was a professor of audience research at Australia's Murdoch University at the time he collaborated on the research. He and his academic colleagues and co-authors, Annie Lang, Patrick Barwise, Renee Weber, and Stephen Bellman, assessed the capabilities of neuromarketing tools that were analyzed in the ARS earlier Neuro1 and Neuro2 initiatives. Their conclusions challenged the methods, called for greater transparency, and cautioned advertisers about using tools which they didn't sufficiently understand. The paper was a clear favorite of our editorial board members. Among their comments, Henry Assel of New York University wrote, this is an emerging area that will become increasingly important and deserves recognition. Incidentally, bus papers are now available free of charge at journalofadvertisingresearch.com. Now, ARF members uh, can access articles for, for free. Uh, if you have difficulty, please contact membership or feel free to email me, nanette at the arf.org. And my name is spelled N-A-N-E-T-T-E. -T -T -E. Dwayne, I'll let you take it from here. Thank you. Thanks, Nanette, and uh, thanks, Nina, as well. Um, so we're going to have a little bit of a journey today going back in time. Um, re-examining some of the findings from the Neuro uh, Standards 1.0 and, and diving a little bit deeper in those findings. Um, and uh, they're interesting because of what they tell us really around uh, neuro measures. Um, so uh, it's, uh, it, it's uh, if, you're, if you're a neuro vendor, it's going to be a very uncomfortable journey in a lot of ways. But I think it's an important journey for us all to have because um, we really are trying to grapple with what these, these measures really mean kind of today. Um, what we're going to explore in a, a lot more depth is this idea that there is no common truth. Uh, oftentimes, neuro measures are kind of positioned as if they're kind of giving us direct access like a window to the soul. And we're going to challenge that idea a little bit today and, and demonstrate that neuro measures are like any other kind of research. How you do the research really does, does matter. 
So that's that's the Reader's Digest version, kind of, of what our findings are really going to be about. But we'll we'll get there eventually today. Um, I want to start by uh, talking a little bit about the the co-authors of this paper. Um, many of you will know uh, some of these names. Um, if you're in the uh, neurospace, you'll know some of these names. Uh, this is a really this is just a wonderful team that came together as a result of the Neurostandards One project and continued the dialogue after the project was kind of officially over. And that's what's led to the deeper analysis that forms uh, the paper. Just to give you a little bit of background on who the authors are, um, Annie Lang is uh, really the, uh, the, the godmother of neuro measures as they're applied to media content. So she really pioneered a lot of the work, of the early work in particular. And a lot of the people who were even the second generation, kind of, if you will, that followed on were really all students of Annie's. And so she was hugely influential in the whole field of applying neural measures to the study of dynamic media content. Um, Patty Barwise, many of you know, what is at the uh, London Business School. I think a real pioneer in applied marketing research. Uh, fantastic track record, wonderful books. Um, so many of you will already be acquainted with Patty. Again, another kind of titan out there. Renee Weber is a very unique individual because he both has a medical doctorate as well as a PhD. And that particular combination gives him particular reign over uh, fMRI. Uh, oftentimes when fMRI research is done, it is done in conjunction with a medical doctor. Um, most institutions that have fMRI machines actually require that. Rene is very unique because he spans both both uh, both the medical as well as the research field, and so and a lot of the work that he's really done in applying fMRI to the media context again has been very impressive. And uh, Steve Bellman is uh, at uh, the Aremberg Bass Institute now. Uh, Steve and I were colleagues together uh, at Murdoch University, running audience. Uh, Labs. Our, our big project together was Beyond 30 Seconds, which many of you may know, which is now in its 12th year uh, as a project. And myself, uh, as uh, Nanette said, at the time of the submission, I was an academic, but I have since retired from academic life because the demands of media science kind of demand uh, my full-time attention, and so I haven't been able to kind of like uh, divide my time as I used to between both my academic and, and uh, industry kind of interests. Um, I also want to give uh, special thanks to Chris Chabri, who was part of the authoring team in the very early stages of, of the manuscript, but it became clear that the work that was required was really going to be a lot more expensive, I think, than he had originally hoped, and so he, he wasn't able to continue on. But his contributions to the manuscript, particularly in those early stages, were fantastic. And Chris and Annie and Patty and Renee were all the core of the review panel that was in Neurostandards 1. And so this was really an extension of that work, um, which Steve and I really helped facilitate. Um, OK, a little bit of background. Um, and so this is where we'll tell a little bit of a story, giving you the background to how the paper came to be and, and what the issues are that we're really grappling with. Um, in 2010, uh, media science at that time was operating under an exclusivity contract with, uh, with the Disney Media Networks. So we were not allowed to work with anybody else. That was really kind of how we got our startup capital. And for our first five years, we operated exclusively for Disney. And in that role, we were as much client as we were vendor. So we had the responsibility and the duty to vet technologies that came along and vendors that came along and we were actively seeking at that time to find a partner to collaborate with uh, on behalf of Disney for neuroimaging, which was at that time kind of coming out with uh, some interesting and impressive studies. And so we thought this would be an interesting space. And many vendors approached us and uh, spoke with us around the possibility of providing and applying neuromeasures to, to media and advertising content. But there were a lot of red flags that would pop up in the conversations that we had with these neuro vendors. For example, one question that we frequently asked the vendors 
is we would say, have you done any validation research on your methods? And the answers were often something like, well, yes, we have. We've done a project for you know, Coca-Cola, and they came back and they used us again. This was not gratifying for us. We were very worried when we heard these things. The other thing that we noticed was that most of the vendors that we talked to didn't have um, proper comparisons. In other words, for example, they were not making comparisons uh, that were statistically significant, where differences were statistically significant. They would frequently uh, you know, just make these arguments that it was like 27% greater. Um, and, and that was particularly alarming because of the very small sample sizes that were typical in the research. So at the time, it was very normal to have sample sizes of about 20, which we on our team rejected as, uh, as being too small to really be able to kind of like use proper stats around. And so these were the kinds of things that were, that were popping up at the time. Just to illustrate this, I'd, I'd like to tell the story of, uh, of uh, the audience measurement conference in 2010. There was a uh, paper that was presented. I won't mention the name of the company or the individual who, who presented it, but they presented a study uh, using EEG. And the study involved uh, three cells. Uh, it was visa ads during the, on television during the Winter Olympics. Visa ads as banners on Facebook, and uh, the third cell was the Visa website. And the uh, the author stands up and says, um, "Now we have ten measures that we're going to talk about today, and many of these measures had absolutely nothing to do with any kind of neuroimaging. And you could see that straight off the bat, so they were red flags." And he said. I've standardized all our measures to a 10-point scale. And he said, anywhere where you see a difference of 0.2, that is statistically significant. So I immediately raised up my hand and I said, wow, a difference of 0.2, how large is your sample? And I'm sitting down there trying to do the math in my head and I'm thinking, you know, he needs 20,000 per cell. I mean, how large could he have possibly done this EG study? And the author proceeds to say, you see, we had 20 people per cell. And I said, well, how do you get statistical significance with 0.2? And he said, because the brain whispers 4,000 times a second. And I said, oh, so you treated each of those as an independent measure? And he said, yes. And he had some explanation as to why that was appropriate. And I said, well, why didn't you just ask people? You know, did you like the ad? Did you like the ad? Did you like the ad? Um, and this was kind of characteristic of it. And this particular company was, was the leading company at the time. And so, you know, if this was the kind of science that was being espoused. There were, there were red flags, a lot of red flags. And those red flags were just from the vendors that we had spoken with. And we didn't know how many other vendors there might be, what other kinds of issues there might be. And so... Uh, we were very worried about what this potentially represented for the industry, and we had real questions ourselves around whether people were doing it right, not doing it right, and so that was really a little bit of the genesis behind uh, the whole Neuroscience project. And at the time, there were some really interesting uh, journal articles that had come out that were really kind of uh, highlighting some of the potential implications. So the uh, McCabe and Castell study, for example, demonstrated that if you had a picture of a brain, you had a picture of neuroimaging uh, in any kind of graph, as opposed to, say, having like a bar graph or something else around the data, that it was statistically more likely that people would believe whatever you said. It was far more persuasive. So this is bad news because people are being persuaded just by the image without any real understanding or regard for what it necessarily means. Um, and then, of course, there was my favorite study, which many of you probably know. Um, it was actually just a poster paper at a conference, but it had huge, it got huge attention. And that was a study that was uh, done by uh, Bennett and a, and a couple of his colleagues. 
And what Bennett did is uh, Bennett took a dead salmon and he put the dead salmon in an fMRI machine and he proceeded to show the dead salmon different images of uh, people engaging in different types of social interaction and he would ask the dead salmon questions while this was happening and he was able to demonstrate significant differences across those images in brain activity using the fMRI machine and and what he really argues in the in, in this uh, paper is that if the um, if the method is not done correctly there's so much statistical interpolation that happens along the way that you actually end up getting false uh, false values. Uh, fantastic paper. The salmon was actually their third attempt at it. They started with a pumpkin, then they went to a dead chicken, and then they went with a dead salmon. But I think the, the dead salmon was the most compelling story that they had around that. So very interesting kind of story. And, and what all of this is really highlighting is that this idea of showing images and drawing conclusions is really playing to the mystical dimension around what these measures mean. And that's a very dangerous approach. And certainly what I think was happening on the client side is many clients lacked, you know, neuroscientists on their staff. And so they're being presented with a proposition which they don't even know kind of like what questions to ask. And so in that environment, it was very easy for people to embrace something without really full regard for uh, what the quality of the measures were that they were potentially getting. Um, so at that conference in 2010, uh, I gave a presentation, um, and at that presentation, I shared this slide. Uh, I, I quoted from uh, Arthur C. Clarke's third law, which is that any sufficiently advanced technology is in indistinguishable from magic. And I said, that is true, and that is exactly what you want from good technology. Good technology should be mystical. That's the, that's the inherent characteristic of what you want with technology. You want to be impressed and stupefied by it. You, know, you want to be amazed by it. But by its very nature, science must be distinguishable from magic. And it was really this whole linking of these neuromeasures to science because all of the vendors are really positioning this as being better because it's somehow this kind of pure science, uh, this capacity to now read emotion, you know, to provide continuous measures, which is a really exciting proposition for us. Um, but if, it's, if that is the case, it needs to be distinguishable. And the key problem that we face even today is that most neuro vendors operate inside black boxes. So most are not transparent with the measures that they use and with the methods that they use for the sake of the proprietary nature of what it is they do. And that proprietary nature creates a, a cloud, uh, a cloak around what they do, which makes it difficult to properly validate and evaluate. So uh, at that conference in 2010, I issued a challenge to the ARS. And the challenge that I issued was that the ARS really needed to spearhead uh, and lead this whole question of validating these measures because no clients on their own really would have the scope to be able to commission you know, all of the narrow vendors to kind of like be able to compare them. We all had a common need as an industry, and there was a real need for someone like the ARF to intervene and really provide that, that thought leadership. And, uh, you know, Bob, to his credit, took the challenge and said, yep, the ARF would do that. They would lead this, uh, this new area. And Bob approached me and asked uh, for my help in putting it together. He said, okay, well, you called for the challenge. Now you're going to have to help us. Um, put it together. And, and my role really was as a facilitator. So I was very careful not to be involved in the review or the analysis. But what I did do was put together a, uh, a process. And that process was no different really to the process that we go through 
with peer-reviewed journal articles, which is let us get the reports as the vendors prepare them, as they would pre prepare them for a client, and let us then send those reports out for peer review, and let us see what the peer review process tells us. So what was great about this was that there were eight vendors who took up the call to their credit, which was a very courageous thing for them to do. It was a very difficult thing for them to do. Uh, and what was wonderful really was that they represented the full kind of spectrum of measures that are in the market even today. So EEG, fMRI, uh, facial coding. Uh, in this case, at that time, it was using expert human coders, uh, facial electromography, which uses uh, electrodes attached to the face, and uh, biometrics. Uh, so it was an exciting project because of the contribution of those eight vendors, which really came together. And there were eight sponsors uh, who, who brought their ads to the equation. And so what we were left with was eight ads for eight vendors to evaluate. And as they went through that process, they collected, most of them collected their data in November of 2010. And as they did that, uh, the vendors prepared their reports, collected the data, prepared their reports, and they then submitted them. And what we had was really very impressive. There were a series of expert reviewers so the smaller dots that you see that are in black, yellow, and green, those represent the expert reviewers. And the expert reviewers were actually prominent um, uh, academics who had established track records for those specific methods. In other words, it was fMRI researchers who were evaluating the, the report that was prepared by a vendor using fMRI. It was uh, EEG experts who were evaluating work that was done by EEG. It was facial coding experts who were evaluating work that was done on, on facial muscle movement, et cetera. And all of those reviewers prepared their independent reviews, and they tabled them to a review panel. And that review panel was a group of five, uh, led by Horst, Horst Dick at the, uh, now at the ARF. Um, and that panel of five brought together all of the reviews and had interviews and met with the vendors. And so there was a real opportunity to further scrutinize, if you will, the reports and uh, to evaluate their contributions. And uh, it was a wonderful process because the sponsors of the research also had the opportunity to meet with the vendors and they also got to ask questions about the research, et cetera. So there was a lot of win-win proposition and a lot of acceleration of, uh, of knowledge around what these different methods potentially represented for advertisers. And the fruit of that was the NeuroStandards 1.0 report, um, which was really a landmark in a number of ways. Uh, it definitely changed the neuro landscape. The whole neuromarketing field, uh, as nascent as it was, was clearly transformed as a result of this study. Um, the two market leaders refused to participate in the Neuro Standards Project, and I think it's clear that they both suffered as a consequence. I think there, it, it, it was very clear that, uh, you know, in one case, um, one of those companies were out of business only a few months later. In the other case, they lost a number of clients afterward. Uh, so not participating in the Narrow Standards Project, I think, was really viewed very negatively in the market. Uh, but also, even participating in it meant that clients in particular started asking questions that they weren't asking before. I think the overall contribution of Narrow Standards 1 was it really removed that most of that mystical layer around people just being kind of like in awe of the measures. And it really brought a, crit a critical scrutiny to it that wasn't there before Neuro One. The other thing I think that was significant about Neuro One is it really marked another chapter for uh, the ARF. Uh, at various stages in the ARF history, it's had an incredibly impressive track record in terms of pioneering and leading industry research. and uh, 
neuro one, I think, was really a, a, a moment which uh, reawakened that potential within the ARF. And that's something that has continued. So the ARF has become that kind of organization once more, really pioneering and leading these, these, these measures. And so not just neuro, across, across a range of initiatives now. So that's really quite, I think, exciting. Um, now, the Neuro One report was a tricky, a, a tricky challenge for the ARS. Um, you didn't really want to penalize these wonderful vendors who had come forward to participate uh, in this. So you didn't want to punish the people who were kind of being good citizens and participating. But by the same token, there were some very substantive issues which the Neuro One report tackled, and it really laid it out there. Uh, and, you know, among those was really this idea that just because these measures are new doesn't give them a waiver in terms of any of the traditional research issues that were there. So questions of sample size, sample location, sample composition, reliability, statistical significance, these things all matter just as much in the neurospace as they do in any other research endeavor. And I think at the time there really was uh, a line that many of the neuro vendors were using or a line of reasoning that many of them were using that somehow um, argued that neuro was different for one reason or another. And the Neuro Standards 1 report really made it clear that, you know, that, that neuro was not different to other research in terms of the burden that it carries across all of those issues. Um, you know, the second thing that really came out was that, um, that clients, that potential buyers, really needed to kick the tires. And they really needed to examine things like, you know, how well trained the people were, who it was, who was actually doing the research, what the quality and the reliability of the equipment being used was. All these kinds of questions were really critical and the buyers really needed to kind of like kick the tires and ask those questions. It was shocking in the, in the study to see that in many cases, you know, there were uh, companies that had very famous dollars attached to their names. But in actual fact, the research was being conducted by uh, people who didn't really have sufficient training in some cases to the job they were doing. And that had led to a number of erroneous conclusions which the reviewers had, had kind of highlighted. So there were these kinds of problems. And, uh, you know, uh, th there were also some questions and challenges around the equipment. And I, I need to say that I think that's the case today just as much as it was then. Um, we are surprised because we do validity studies all the time on equipment, and there is equipment in the market that we believe to be substandard, to not be reflecting accurately the measures, but we're surprised that, you know, these are in common use among many vendors. And so there are these kinds of questions that are out there. Um, and then finally, there was a lot uh, raised around the whole question of interpreting the data and drawing the insights out of the data. And in, in many cases, uh, these insights were being drawn by people who were not really familiar. Oftentimes, they didn't have a background in marketing. They had a background in their, in their measure, but not in marketing, for example. But yet they felt comfortable drawing conclusions, which you know, most marketers, I think, really uh, w would not have been as comfortable kind of drawing. And, and the report really encourages uh, clients to, to see themselves as uh, having an ownership stake in that insight side of the, uh, the findings, because in many cases, um, the findings were not really supported by the actual evidence. There was a reach that was occurring to some extent uh, in, in the conclusions, and, um, and that was a dangerous thing. So those were kind of some of the highlights of some of the problems that were emerging in the data. And, and what was beautiful about the NeuroStandards 1 report was this was not really meant to indict the industry. It was really meant to help elevate it. It was really meant to help identify the kinds of things that needed to be in place for the industry to really kind of like take off more. And I think that that proved to be quite true. Um, 
So now we come to this paper. So the review panel, again, which were the key scholars kind of at the top of that uh, pyramid who were bringing together all the reviews, um, you know, the review panel was uh, challenged by what any review panel of this type would be challenged with, which was that the volume of research that came in was pretty extensive. There was a lot there, and there was very little time to actually process it to draw the conclusions. So the review panel had a couple of days, and of course, then it had to correspond by email, and so there really wasn't the full opportunity. Um, certainly, the conclusions that went into Neuro One were, were uh, you know, um, the low-hanging fruit that, that was kind of visible and evident through that process. But the review panel felt that this was a very, very, very rich data set, which demanded deeper exploration, and which the review process itself didn't adequately address. And that was a process that would take a long time, so it didn't really fit the scope of Neuro One. So what followed was the review panel continued the dialogue. And in the initial stages, much of that dialogue was really around methodology and how could they explore the data, particularly within a lot of constraints. So, for example, one of those constraints was that the advertisers who had volunteered their ads did not want the results for their individual ads being made public. And so now suddenly you are faced with these challenges of how can we tell the story of what's happening if we can't actually kind of like tell the story completely. Um, and likewise, the data was limited because of the proprietary nature of what many of the vendors did. And so unlike a traditional academic study where you had access to all the data, the underlying data, when you were trying to do some type of larger analysis, here the panel was limited because it, it has to kind of figure out what it can do with what it had. And so that led to a very long and lengthy discussion around a range of methods and which methods might help. And, and I want to say at the outset, the review panel had no vested interest either way. It really was the case that the review panel just had a passion for the data, and it really just wanted to better understand what was kind of happening, you know, under the hood behind a lot of these measures and what it could learn by taking what was such a rich and valuable data set with all these different vendors, with all these different methods, to try to see what insights could be derived. And the overwhelming conclusion that came out of this study was that there was no common truth. And what we mean by that was it was not, all these vendors were not telling the same story. They were all telling very different stories, which challenged the underlying notion that this was pure science. So, for example, uh, four of the vendors uh, had data in graph form that we could synthesize, which talked about uh, positive emotion. And when you look at the four, what you see is very, very, very different stories. So just looking at the data, by bringing them all together in one graph, as the review panel did, it was immediately apparent that these were not one story, but they were different stories. And there were potentially a range of issues, including things like cognitive lag that might explain it, but uh, at the outset, we were just dealing with the question of, of were they in fact telling the same story or were they telling different stories? And this was even more true when you talked about engagement. So if you talk about engagement, here's what the story looks like for vendor one. This is for a particular ad. This is what it looks like for vendor two. This is what it looks like for vendor four. This is what it looks like for vendor seven, and this is what it looks like for vendor eight. So you end up with really no point in time when anybody is agreeing on anything about what's really happening in this app. And of course, that's very alarming. Part of the problem, of course, is that there are, they're all measuring very different constructs. Even though they all say they're measuring engagement, 
what they mean by engagement is in fact very different. And this is really kind of part of the core of the problem. And the same is also true with uh, positive emotion. Now, another way that we analyze the data is many of them commented on key moments or key points in time. And so our thinking was, okay, well, maybe they're not all right or not all telling the same story kind of on a second by second continuous basis. But maybe if we look at kind of like these key epochs, if we look at these key moments that occur, maybe there'll be some consistency there. But when we look at that story again, we see no common truth. We see an, uh, out of eight uh, different vendors on eight commercials, we see an average of 2.2 saying a particular moment is good, one saying it's bad, and 4.8 not mentioning it. So again, very different stories. But perhaps the most compelling way to analyze this was to rank the data. And the ranking of the data occurred a number of ways. Um, one, it occurred because the vendors were asked to rank their data. Some, rather than rank the data, provided numeric scores, and so the review panel or the authors were able to uh, assign rankings to them based on the numeric scores, and some refused to participate in that exercise altogether in the original NERF standards. But we, nonetheless, we did have data from a number of vendors for both the engagement construct and the positive emotion construct. And we could then look at the rankings and we could compare them. And at first glance, as you look at these, you see that they're telling very different stories. So what we're going to do is we're going to do a multi-trait, multi-method correlation matrix to see how they were related. <laughs> and then, uh, look at the journal article. Uh, I think somebody can mute their phone. Somebody's... Thank you. Um, in the journal article, it's just in black and white. In this presentation, I have the benefit of color, so I can explain this a little bit better. But these are basically all the correlations between the different measures and the different vendors. And so the letters there, A, represent unaided recall measures. The Bs represent positive emotion measures, and the Cs represent engagement measures. And the vendors here, we're just calling them first, second, third, fourth, and fifth. They're just different vendors there. Again, we're disguising the vendors in this context uh, to some extent. Um, and what we would expect to see if we had high convergent validity is the blues are different vendors correlations around unaided recall. You see very low at 0.27. The, uh, the purples or the pinks, you know, a little bit better around positive emotion at 0.54. That's not bad. Um, but the engagement in particular is, is pretty bad. Um, you're looking at very weak correlations, really no correlations. There are a few vendors like uh, vendor seven, and um, <clears throat> vendor one on the engagement had a point type two, which is a little bit more respectable. But you know, this is not what you kind of would expect from these measures. We would have expected to see 0 0.6, 0 0.7, not 0.5. And we can also look at it in terms of the predictive uh, validity. So <clears throat> we might expect, for example, that ads that are generating more positive emotion would be more likely to generate more engagement. But when we look at the uh, relations between the positive emotions and the engagement, which we've done here in purple, you see, again, very weak correlations. Uh, and likewise, when we look at the engagement um, relationship with unaided recall. So you would again think that if people are engaged, then they're more likely to recall, and again, very poor correlation. And so what we conclude from all of this is that um, the, there is not a common truth that everyone is accessing. How you do this research is actually instrumental to what you find. Um, very similar to any other marketing research endeavor. Neurostandards is no different. It is bound by exactly the same challenges as every other research method. 
and it should be held to the same accountability standards. So uh, what is, of course, this was a long time ago. This study, Neuro Standards 1, was in 2010. It's now six years later, and a lot has changed in six years, um, where at that time there were really around 10 companies in the world that were doing this. Now there are over 100. So there's really been a tenfold growth. And of course, where there were really only a handful of clients who were doing it back in 2010, now there are many clients who use these measures. Many use it in their day-to-day -day business as well. So the field has really matured and grown grown a lot in that time period. Um, and in the good news department, there have been studies, particularly in the past year, there have been a number of studies that have demonstrated a very clear link between these narrow measures and sales performance. And incidentally, those same studies have demonstrated very poor relationships between traditional measures and sales performance. Um, so this is, I think, highlighting a lot of the potential positive contributions. Algorithms have gotten better, and I think that's translating into significant improvements that we're seeing out there in terms of the neural, the neural, uh, the, the neural measures among many vendors, not all. Um, but I really want to highlight in closing that the issues that were present in Neuro One are still present today, and they haven't gone away. The industry still lacks transparency. It still lacks common standards. Um, and given the fact that there is no common truth, that lack of transparency is very alarming. And so we need to see much greater transparency, even if not to the industry as a whole, to clients. Clients really deserve to know more about exactly how it is that the research is being done, because they do need to approach it with the same kind of scrutiny um, that they would approach any other research endeavor. Um, and so uh, we still see this field as a nascent field in its early stages, and it's a field with enormous promise and enormous potential. It still does provide good, solid measurement around emotion. It still does provide great continuous measurement, but it still has a lot of challenges which also need to be addressed. As my parting gift, um, because tonight's uh, debate will be on, I know a lot of people will, of course, uh, are interested in, in knowing kind of like what happens with the debate. So I want to share with you um, a couple of slides. This is just like a parting gift from the second presidential debate, which was uh, last week, Monday. Um, and the results are really fascinating. So this is research that we did uh, on behalf of a client, um, but we have permission now to share that with you. I'm, I'm pleased to share this with you. And so um, what you're looking at is the uh, electrodermal activity, the skin connectivity response for um, Republicans, Democrats, and undecided voters. And uh, one of the things that's really interesting is, as you see in this graph, undecided voters are really participating and they're really attending to the debate. Normally, what we see when we do research like this is we see that undecided voters exhibit significantly lower levels of arousal than um, supporters do. But here you're seeing that those, that those undecided voters are very actively participating throughout that debate. And in fact, what was really interesting, if I aligned this to the key moments of the debate, what you find is that Republicans and Democrats are actually more similar in many ways than undecideds. And in particular, the big difference is undecideds are much more responsive to issues. And the Trump and, and Hillary supporters really were much more involved in the attacks and the drama and those, those kinds of characteristics around the debate. But the most fascinating thing that we found in the debate was the huge difference that we saw exhibited between men and women um, in the debate. And uh, in particular, what was fascinating is uh, all the video gate kind of discussions, you know, had women at the edge of their seats. Men were far less engaged during those moments and throughout most of the debate. Uh, there were key moments where both men and women kind of like responded, like for example, the Islamophobic uh, line of questioning. But then there are also things like discussions of the war in Syria, which clearly resonated more with men and 
we kind of saw them reacting a little bit more. But I just thought it'd be kind of fun to and given the debates with a little uh, a little treat there of kind of seeing some of the, the data that you know we've been playing around with with the debates. Not related to uh, not immediately related to today's topic, but I just threw it in there as a bonus. Um, and so we have now ten minutes for questions. So we can open up the floor. Zena will help us. So if you have questions, type it in your chat box. And Zena's seeing the chat activity, and she will read them out loud, and we can all respond to them. Thank you, Dwayne. Um, can you hear me? Okay. Yeah, I hear you. Okay. All right. So the first question: Given the range of issues you raise regarding neuromarketing measures, are the measures really all that useful? And if so, what, under what circumstances? Great question. So I think it would be a mistake having heard today's seminar to draw the conclusion that um, that uh, neuromeasures are, are bad measures or that they don't work or anything like that. Um, in fact, really what, what we have found across uh, other studies, and I think what, what, you know, not just us, but there are other studies as well, is that there are great contributions that these measures do make. But they do have limitations. And we do need to, I think, as an industry, be a lot more conservative in how we're using these measures. At the same time, though, they're indispensable. Um, you know, great continuous measures, and the only alternative we have for continuous measurement is dial testing, which is fraught with much bigger problems. Um, great in terms of measuring um, implicit uh, memory and, and a lot of uh, implicit attitudinal measures that you can't measure easily, uh, great again for uh, exploring human emotion. But it just needs to be done with, I think, a higher level of scrutiny and with a higher level of caution. Next question. Are newer marketer vendors becoming more or less willing to be transparent with their measures and in what areas or involving what types of, of methods? So since Neuro, Neuro One was really the first dialogue between Neuro vendors, and that was a huge accomplishment, again, for the ARF. Just, just facilitating that dialogue among Neuro vendors, I think, was a huge achievement. But now there are a number of forums where uh, neuromarketers talk to each other, you know, both uh, in terms of kind of like uh, you know, through social media, et cetera, but also in conferences, you know, like there's the um, NMSBA, which is one association which represents neuro vendors. Um, so there are forums where people are talking. And there is a lot of good cross-fertilization, I think, that is starting to occur. But there still remains far too much black box and proprietary kind of um, – we can't tell you how we do it because we would be giving away our IP. And, and that is uncharacteristic of other neuroscience fields. For example, you don't see that in, in the neuroeconomics discipline. And so there's really, uh, I think, no need for the level or for the lack of transparency that still prevails far too much, I think, in our industry. Next question. Where will neuromarketing be in 2020? Where will you see the biggest area of improvement and validation of measures as advertisers demand more transparency? So um, the pace of the neuromarketing area, I think, is moving very rapidly. And what is moving it most rapidly, I think, is, um, is the client side of the equation. Clients are... Uh, discovering neuromarketing, you know, not only kind of like in a one-off study, but increasingly um, clients are starting to use neuromeasures more in their day-to-day -day business. And I think that is increasing the volume of work. The volume of work is increasing the extent to which people are having to invest in their algorithms uh, and uh, so and, and in the and they, um, tools that we're using, and so I do see very significant growth happening. So in 2020, I think that you will see much greater translation of the neuro measures into day-to-day. -day. And I think that, again, I was making reference to some of the studies this past year 
which demonstrated the strong positive relationship between these neural measures and sales behavior. And I think that those studies have, are really proving to be um, instrumental in helping move the industry a lot further along and embracing this. So I would expect to see much greater day-to-day -day translation of uh, this research into uh, everyday kind of practice going into the future. What was the sample in the presidential debate study? Great question. So the presidential debate study um, has some limitations, uh, primarily through our capacity. So it's not something that we publish. It's something that we do a little bit for R&D. And the reason for that is because we can't actually get the sample size that we need. Now, we have over 70 people in that sample. And, 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 and we've done a lot of work around what the appropriate sample size is. And 70 per cell is, you know, according to Cohen, you know, what you would need for a medium effect size. And, and that's the effect size that we believe we're typically working with. So 70 per cell, we believe, is the minimum that you really kind of need for this type of research. The problem that we have is although we have 70 in the overall aggregate, really what we need is 70 per condition. So ideally, we would like to have 70 Republicans, or I should say Trump supporters, 70 Hillary supporters, and 70 undecideds. So that's really 210 is what we needed. But across our Chicago and Austin labs, we did not have enough capacity to be able to collect that much data live. And so that was the reason why we only had the 70 in that study. But it is another, inadequate for a proper analysis at those levels. Uh, another question around the sample size. Isn't facial coding the only one around today with statistical significance? Can we read secondary emotions, not just basic? So facial coding has a lot of problems as well, a lot of opportunity and a lot of challenge. Um, so I don't accept the premise that it's the only one that can have scale, if you will. Um, again, in most cases, you don't need live data. And so if you don't need live data, you can build scale by collecting the data over time. So that's what typically happens in most of the studies that we facilitate, for example. 70 at one time may not be a lot, but 70 over a week, of course, is huge. So you can collect. So there are studies, for example, there was a study that we did for Mars, that had over a thousand subjects, you know, that was wired. So, so scale is possible, but um, there are other issues. For example, to get that scale, you go to a webcam. Once you go for, to a webcam rather than a camera in a lab, you no longer have control over lighting. Suddenly you're introducing a little bit more noise. Um, there are problems associated with different facial coding measures. Some of them require multiple muscle. Uh, analysis of multiple muscle movement, you know, muscle, multiple muscles moving. So th there are lots of challenges, and we, we don't have time to go into all of that right now. But um, I do think that that facial coding does have the potential to scale, but so do some of the others. So biometrics, for example, I think also has the capacity to scale. Okay, so I have time for two more questions. Um, first of the two are our self reported measures compared against neural measures? So uh, again, there are other studies that have done that. Um, there is uh, an article that we have that's going to be coming out in an upcoming issue of uh, JAR that, that explores that specific question. Uh, some research that we did in collaboration with um, the Arms and Gas Institute in Mars. So that'll be a, a good paper, I think, that we'll explore. So hopefully we'll have a webinar on that topic in the future. <laughs> <laughs> um, and last question. Do you believe that there really is proprietary IT in these methods? Um, yes, there is proprietary IT. Um, the question is, uh, is what you do with it and what your, you know, what, what the trade-offs are. Uh, let me just give you an example. There's a study that we do every year where we make predictions for the upcoming sitcoms on broadcast television. And we do that in May when the trailers come out. And we test just the trailers for sitcoms. Now, as it turns out, um, 
sitcom trailers are very good ambassadors for what the show is like. So testing the trailer ends up being a very good instrument for making those predictions. And we discovered an algorithm that was what we called emotional velocity, which basically describes the roller coaster ride that people go through, the range of emotions that people are kind of like going through in their experience. And we were very upfront in sharing that, you know, at the MN and SBA conference, we shared that with the entire industry. So we could have played the role of proprietary measure, you know, not wanting to share it, but there is a greater good that comes really from advancing the industry, we believe. And so we felt we had a duty to kind of share that with the industry, and we did. And so, you know, there is a trade-off that everybody, I think, has to grapple with, but, but there's a greater good, I think, that comes from, from transparency. And even if you're not transparent with the industry as a whole, at least under MBA in your relationships with clients, we believe, people need to have that transparency with their clients at the very least. Okay, that's all. Uh, these are all the questions that I have. Dwayne, do you have any last words you want to share with us? Thanks for joining us today. Um, <laughs> <laughs> we look forward um, to lots of exciting research in the future together. Thank you so much for presenting the study and the paper uh, to our webcast crowd. Um, and I wish you all a great day. Thanks very much.